right? I don't know how much my internet connection is going to like this. It's going to explode. It's probably going to explode. Something's going to explode. We don't know what yet, but something will explode at some point. I would think Zoom in itself will stream directly. So we are live on YouTube. That's exciting. Hi, right? YouTube. I don't know if it, I don't think it shows our faces. The YouTube it, stream is just the. So it is showing our faces. Glad you guys are on this call. With all your technical knowledge, I wouldn't even know how to operate all this equipment. It's even worse when you consider the fact that I currently am running two different internet service providers <laughs> to do this. So I'm piggybacking my neighbor's internet upstairs as well. Yeah, I type in Fusion 360 YouTube, which is the picture of Lars. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. I, if you type it into Google, Fusion 360 YouTube. It literally... I'm sorry. Lars from 2016. going over I'm there. sorry you got to deal with my face. Oh, it's no worries. So if everything goes to plan here, we should see Cam Slam. And you said it's live on YouTube, too. They probably could hear us right now, too, can't they? There's 23 watching there. Really? Nice. Yes. All right. So give me one sec here. I'm going to go ahead and call Troy back and let's get him in for our customer testimonial and let's get this going. So in case YouTube is watching, we're trying something new here. So uh, bear with us. <laughs> Exciting. All right, I'm in the chat in YouTube. Ah, awesome. Looks like we are a go between all systems. Let me just go ahead and call in Troy. So welcome everybody. We're here with we're here with Lars. Yeah, hi everyone. With uh, Lars and and his two bearded friends. Lars wish he could grow a beard like that, but I can't. One day. I tried. I tried. My wife told me just don't. No. She told me just don't even try. It's never gonna work. I hear that. My wife tells me. My head is too small without my beard, so. <laughs> I actually think you can go out on YouTube, you can find some videos, probably like 2017 or something where I have a beard and uh, well, whatever you want to call it. it. It only lasted for about a month or so and then it was like. So this is the cam slam. Bill and Devin are going to show some golden nuggets. I'm here to learn. Allegedly. I am here to learn. I got a notepad. I got a pen. I'm going to take some notes. So Phil has some very uh, complex uh, setup <laughs> setups to get uh, get what we want to try to do today. So hopefully it works. We don't run into any issues. Again, we are on Zoom in addition to the YouTube, so we'll try to keep an eye on the chat over there. Also. Hey, yeah. Troy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hey, does that sound better to you? Yeah, you were breaking up before. Yeah, Troy, so you are live on YouTube as well as a Zoom webinar for our 30-minute CAM challenge. I know you are a current customer of Fusion 360. A um, couple of questions here for you, just to give you an idea. Lars Christensen is on the line. Lars, if you want to say hi. 
Hey, Troy, how you doing? Hey, how's, how's it going? Good. So, I know outside of that, Troy, you've watched plenty of Lars's videos to get schooled up inside of Fusion 360 and all that, correct? Yes, I have. Awesome. So do you want to give me a little bit about what it is that you do at your shop, your industry, maybe a little bit of your background as to how you got to where you are? As far as overall or? Yeah, just overall. Give us a little bit of history of what it is that your current industry, um, how did you get into machining? How many years you've been uh, at it? Started out as an auto mechanic and found out there was no money in it. So there was a production uh, shop up the street hiring. So I went up there and uh, spent six years there, got into quality control, then went into the tool and die trade. Uh, been around three or four shops in the area, a journeyman tool maker, but I always had the CNC passion. So um, I basically bought a couple uh, CNC knee mill and a TM1 Haas mill and put it in my garage and started making parts while I was working at John Deere as a tool maker. And uh, ended up quitting in 2010, going full time. So now I have six machines and three three people and one part time. Okay, cool, awesome. So I know you switched to Fusion 360 about a year ago, correct? Has it been that long? It's yeah. Been- <laughs> It's been a little over a year. So outside of that, what was some of the reasons why you considered switching to Fusion 360? What was maybe some of the headaches and pains that you had with other softwares? Well, the previous software I used, which I won't mention, um, kept getting bought out by different companies, and they would never fix the issues that we brought up. Um, Hide Toolpath was a big one, and um, I finally got fed up. And as you know, you were working here, so you talked me into getting into it. So here I am. Understandable. Awesome. Great. And going into the future, what do you think is kind of your plans with Fusion 360? What are kind of like improvements that you've seen just based on Fusion 360 versus your other softwares? Um, There's a lot of, it seems to be like, I don't know, every other week or so, there's always um, updates and then they show you what they changed. A lot of times it's, you know, stuff that doesn't pertain to what I do, but I've seen some things uh, improved, you know, in the last six months that we really like. I had uh, my my senior guy that I had for nine years, he quit and went to uh, another uh, place of employment, and we had a young guy start at 18, and he's now twenty, going to be 22, and he was just waiting in the wings, and once... <clears throat> this guy um left us he took over and he's been going gangbusters with the software so he likes it and he's i mean he's doing super with it and but young kids pick that up quicker than us old parts you know so (laughs) awesome (laughs) is there anything else that you would like to add in i know tdm machining is your company you guys are out of dubuque iowa um i know we didn't really touch on the basis of industry but what are some of the machines you have around your shop that fusion basically plug and played and went about your business uh we have uh we have three houses one lathe and two mills uh three and a four um i have an akuno akuma genos 560v and a toyota um what is that i forget how big it's a 630s toyota horizontal and um, there's not really a whole lot. I mean, the, I, I believe if you remember, right, most of the, uh, posts work right out of the box. Correct. There's I, a couple little tweaks here and there, but they work, you know, even the fourth axis, um, we tweaked last week and, um, I've ran five or six different parts already on our indexer with no problem. So, um, what I like about it is we're a job shop. So we do one, two, five pieces or 20, but on the one and two pieces, if you get out there and you realize you didn't want that zero where it was at, you go in there and move the zero, everything updates, you're not going back in like my old software and have to regenerate each tool path individually. That's just you hit generate and it pops, it's done, you, you go back out. And, I mean, I trust it enough now that um, I have no worries with it. So, Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I like it. Yep. Great to hear. 
Sorry, question for you. So you said you had your job shop. Do you do you use Fusion for any kind of design work at all? For any any type of what? Design work. Like, do you design parts? Um, no, we don't. We don't design parts. We get all our usually get all our models and stuff from our customers, but we design fixtures off the parts or for the parts or jaws or um, mounting plates and stuff like that. So, but as far as actual design work, we don't do any of that. Well, the, the work holding can from time to time be, uh, be, be harder than designing the part itself, I think. Yeah, yeah, it can be. <laughs> but that's All right. For sure. Well, thanks, Troy, for joining us and giving us a testimonial. Anything that you would want to say that you wish Fusion would have at the moment before we go ahead and let you go and get into our cam slam? A free programmer. A free programmer. All right. So if anybody's looking for work in the Iowa, Wisconsin, <laughs> Illinois area, please reach out to Troy Donut. But yeah. Other than that, Troy, you have a great rest of your day. Um, I know Troy at this point did provide us with a part for us to do this cam slam on between Devin and myself. Um, at this point, jumping into things, Lars, I do need you to request remote control. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions, we do have a Q&A section generated inside of Zoom as well as you do have the ability to leave comments on the YouTube channel. Just like most of you as machinists, um, all three of us on this are wearing multiple hats. I have the luxury of controlling the live stream and everything, as well as Devin is over there on the YouTube channel. And Lars himself, our special guest commentator, is going to be the one controlling all the question and answers inside of Zoom. So at any time, if you guys have questions, like I said, post them in there. And we're about ready to kick this off. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, Devin, if you're ready, I think uh, everybody should be able to see uh, the dual screen set up here, what I think is super fancy, and I get to uh, I get to control it. So if I press a button here, we can see uh, the part on uh, on Devin's screen. Devin, can you uh, wiggle the part? See a little wave. You'll just see. You'll see it uh, in a few seconds here. <laughs> so there is about an eight second delay from. A little bit of delay. I... That's okay. Hey, I'm cutting out, Phil. I yeah, get no back problem, Troy. You can hang out. <laughs> All right. No, I'm going to go. I got to go right. back to work here. All right, hang take on. care. All right. If, if we can get Troy a, a free program, he could have attended. <laughs> so. And we can see Phil's screen here. Yep. There's a little bit more reaction. So, yep, then we get a little wave. That's awesome. So the idea, this is a really cool part. I, I, I like this part. This reminds me of, kind of the type of part that I many times would have seen when, when I used to work at, at, at Ridlam. And um, the, the cool thing about this is we get to see you too and how you would approach programming, programming this part. Um, there's an interesting, some interesting fillets uh, things going on on this part that I, that I find interesting. And I can't wait to see kind of how you guys are gonna, gonna solve that. So I think we should just, Kind of jump into it. Uh, two uh, master machinists here, and and with your knowledge, and uh, let's see you guys jumping in and uh, and start working on uh, programming this part. All righty, Lars, you want to give us a countdown first, or you want to just jump right into it? Three, two, one, camera it up, guys. All right, here we go. I mean, I, like I said, I brought my notepad. I'm gonna be taking my own notes here. Uh, so we can kind of see how these two guys are gonna kind of probe this, and I got the chat open to in the in the webinar, and uh, just throw your your uh, your questions in there, and I'll I'll answer those as we're going going on here. Uh, I'm gonna jump in, and uh, this is quickly. I can switch around on the screens, so we can zoom in a little bit. We can see what's happening. So um, you know, the first thing you got to do when you're working with cam inside of fusion is you got to create the setup kind of where you define your stock defining your uh, your work offset like g54 and so forth and we can see here that devin is uh is working on kind of starting setting up his first operation and uh devin is uh, jumping in to do some uh, some adaptive and if you are new um to some of these cam tool paths with infusion the adaptive tool path is one of these <clears throat> tool paths where it goes in and it keeps a constant removal rate uh, on the cotter. 
So you, you never ever take, you know, like you can go in with your cutter in the corner and suddenly you're, you're, you're filling up the cutter uh, with a lot of, of, of metal. You never run into that with, uh, with adapters. So that makes that a super good tool path to, uh, to rough out with. Now jumping over to Devin, I think Devin has started out with a facing operation um, to go ahead and start creating some, some tips on his part. And he's also then jumping into uh, to do a, an adapt to a path. I think that for most people, uh, you know, you want to kind of start removing that material and adaptive is definitely, um, definitely the tool for that. Now, I think that, I don't know if I can see it, if I go back to both of them, I think both of them went with the 2D adaptive and uh, there is also a adaptive clearing in the three axis that still is doing type of 2D operations, meaning that it will lower the Z axis and then move in X, Y, lower the Z, move in X, Y. But that will also take into consideration any tabled walls. What I don't think we have on this part today, but um, if you should- Lars, go... I actually went with the 3D adaptive clearing versus the 2D. <laughs> All right, Phil. As, as did I. <laughs> so we actually both kind of went about the same way here. I love that. So yeah, and one of the nice things about, let you just see how good a commentator I am. Um, don't have me call a football game. Um, but so the, the big idea behind the, the three uh, axis adaptive is that you don't have to select any change. Um, you actually, you know, with a 2D adaptive, you would have to go in and select edges or faces where with the free uh, D adaptive, uh, then you let the fusion will just analyze the, the part because it's a solid, it knows there's something there and apply the, the, the free D adaptive around that. Now, good question from Rob here is, so why will you use the free D over the 2D? Well, I would say that the, the nice thing about the free D is that it just looks at the whole part and start removing material around the whole part. The nice thing about the 2D adaptive is you probably have a little bit more control with that because you got to go in and select those, um, those edges and, uh, and, fa and, and faces on that. So if you wanted to just rough out a certain portion uh, on the part first, then you could use the 2D adaptive. And you know, among us uh, CAM programmers, machinists, whatever tool makers, whatever we are, we know that we do like to control exactly where the cutter goes at, at what point. Uh, so that is the explanation on that. I'll come back to um, Leo's question in a little bit about uh, as talking about the extensions, manufacturing extensions for sure here. Now, I just wanted to zoom in here on Devon because Devon um, have started adding, working on this fillet, uh, what we talked about. And um, I can see that he added on the steep and shallow tool path in here. What is um, is a fairly new, newer tool path uh, inside of Fusion 360. It's actually a tool path that we borrowed from our friends uh, over um, on the, the Dell Camp side from Power Mill. Uh, so few, so Autodesk purchased Power Mill some years ago, and we are now adopting some of that technology into. Um, into Fusion. And actually, I'm pretty sure that Stephen Shallow is actually part of the manufacturing extension. Um, so the idea behind Stephen Shallow is it's actually kind of a combination of a couple of different tool paths. And um, the best way to, uh, to talk about those is actually probably just if you are doing a tool path where you have steep walls, then in Fusion, you normally will select one tool path. If you have like a flat area, you will select another tool path. Steep and shallow will actually take both those tool paths into consideration uh, and, and work with those. I should also point out that Devin um, very quick, quickly jumped in and actually also created a second stock setup with uh, creating what I believe was an STL file he got in there and he's now setting up his second stock, uh, or his second stock. What will give him the opportunity that when he is uh, simulating inside of Fusion, he will be able to see what he did on his first operation and then flipping the pot over, he will see what he's done on his second operation. 
All right, now let's jump in and see a little bit what Phil is working on. Phil um, has already added quite a few tool pads. He got some, you see his facing operation and um, also been in and adding a couple of more operations. So Phil is taking care of removing materials from these holes. What is, uh, what is another good way? But I remember back when I used to work uh, at Ridlam, the owner, John Ryder, would always say that the fastest way to remove material on a mill is by drilling. Uh, so uh, looks like Phil had been in there and working on that, which is awesome. All right. So one question here is, would you suggest anyone who knows CAD to learn CAM or machining? That is a, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it depends on where you want to end up in, uh, in your career. Uh, but there's no doubt about that. I think some of the best uh, designers are the ones who also understand the process where the, the, the design's going to end up, right? Um, I have always suggested to, uh, to anybody that um, if you are going to become a designer, you should go down on the shop floor and become friends with, you know, the old guy down there who runs the machine because they have a lot of experience uh, in, in actually making the, the part. And coming in here and learning the cam is gonna give you, it's gonna appreciate, you know, some of the things that is easy to do in the design software that is not so easy to do in manufacturing. Uh, we always like to talk about that it's very hard to, um, to machine an inner shop corner, for example, but it's very easy to put into in, in the design side, right? Like you can just, you know, extrude a square through a block, but it's really, really hard to manufacture that. Uh, so learning some of these limitations from the manufacturing will definitely, definitely uh, help you out. Now looking at Devin here right now, Devin is uh, using a contour tool pad, but notice what he's doing, selecting edges. So he's actually selecting uh, two edges here uh, to, to mill out that slot. Um, and um, this is one of the best tricks that actually is inside of, uh, inside of Fusion. And I might actually just have, here we can see Devin is simulating machining that out. And uh, Devin, would you, um, I know that you're a little bit behind us, but would you just go in and maybe just show one more time, a little bit slower, how you picked those edges? Because this, I think, is a little bit of an unknown secret uh, for many people using using CAM. Yeah, for sure. So normally, um in the geometry selection, I'll just clear my selection here. There's a multitude of different ways to do this, but when I'm picking like this and I'm getting a closed contour by default, we can use that selection. Um, hovering over it will bring us into the contour editor, which is one method of, of changing it. And I can change it from closed contour to open contour. So basically what Fusion's trying to do here when it's set to closed contour, the blue line is what, what you selected and the black lines are what Fusion thinks you want. So you don't have to select all the contours when, if you have, you know, a bunch of splines or a bunch of chains like that, but what'll, what'll happen is um, Fusion will just let you kind of pick the start and the end and it'll pick everything in between for you. So it's trying to help you out in this situation though. So normally I don't do this when I know I just need a little line segment here and I'm having some sort of selection. So we could change this to open contour. We could pick this other contour and then hit accept. That's one way to do it. Um, my preferred method is if you hold down alt, it'll actually default to single um, uh, to open contour selection. So we don't look for that closed contour. And then I can hover over this and add the other contour. One other way to do it would just be to hold down alt and select the single contours. I'm not a big fan of this because sometimes we do get these broken segments. We have the arrow on the wrong side, which I would say 99% of the time Fusion's going to be able to select it properly for you. Um, but you know, now that I have three chains here, I would really kind of just want to have two. So I would, maybe it's my OCD, but I would edit this to just be connected there and then hit okay. And then I did modify it just to start from this because it was pretty ambitious to take that in, uh, in a few passes there at the full depth. That's awesome. That is a, uh, 
that's a super trick. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, this is one of those things. I actually don't know how you're going to learn this unless you're sitting watching uh, a video <laughs> like this and then seeing somebody else doing it. I definitely, that's not something you would ever discover yourself. You can also see here where uh, Devin is simulating it again. We see that stock that he set up uh, from the first operation. Very nice. All right. Let's go back to here. And Mr. Phil looks like he is a, uh, <laughs> Phil is a Star Wars uh, <laughs> fan. So, Lars, I'm having technical difficulties. My computer is not thoroughly enjoying the ability to stream three webcams simultaneously. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my sharing momentarily, and I'm going to see if I can get my computer to kick Fusion as a priority. So it's not so much Fusion's fault, so nobody can think that overall. It's all the video streaming and bandwidth I'm hogging up, doing all the hosting of everything at the moment. Do it, man. Do it. Do no it. problem. It's all good. Yeah, I mean, Phil is literally, uh, he have he have run cable from his next door neighbors to uh, to suck out his Wi-Fi, I think, um, running three or four machines to make all this happen. So we appreciate it, Phil. Go ahead and do that. And that just gives Devin just a, you know, Devin gets a head start here. <laughs> we'll see if we can catch him. Don't worry, Lars. We got plenty <laughs> of time left. That's all good. All right, so we can see again uh, that Devin is uh, is jumping in and utilizing uh, the steep and shallow toolpath for all these fillers. Like I said earlier, it's really a nice toolpath because it kind of blends the vertical edges uh, with the flat bottoms whenever you're you're looking for that. And you can actually turn inside of that toolpath. You can actually turn on uh, you know your five axis capabilities. So if you have a five axis machine, you can go in and, and you can turn the tilt on and things like that and have a work with that. But though that this tool pad is what I would consider a pretty advanced tool pad, you still will see that you have the same five taps in there. You know, that you select your tool, you select the geometry, you select the heights that you want the tool to be controlling within. You have your passes tab, what is, uh, when you control like the step downs or with and then the link tab, the last tab, what has to do with how the cutter is cutting between the, the, the tool movements. So if you just remember that, that the passes tab is when the tool is engaged and the linking tab is when the tool is retracting and moving around uh, to other places, it makes that a little bit help, uh, helpful. Um, Devin right now is in working on uh, adding his own drill cycle. So the drill cycles don't actually only have four taps in it because we don't really need, uh, need any more of that. Also kind of cool that Devin in this point here, as you can see, he's in the manufacturing workspace, but he's utilizing the measuring icon up on the tool uh, bar to, uh, to take some measurements, checking some holes, making sure he gets uh, the right diameter um, in there. So if you have, if you maybe have missed that, that is actually in the manufacturing workspace. Um, I think in the beginning, I made the mistake of kind of like going back to the design workspace if I had to measure something. So, so that is, is kind of nice to have that. All right. And again, anybody on the, in the Zoom call, feel free to, uh, to throw in any, uh, any type of uh, questions in the in the chat here? I uh, see we got Rob. Um, Rob is an instructor at a university in the UK, so thank you for joining us, Rob. And uh, it's cool to see that you guys are teaching design for manufacturing. Um, that's that's awesome. And it is kind of interesting how, in, I think in the past, those two trades, the the design person with you know the manufacturing person was too separate but i do think that in today's age it's coming uh you know they're coming more and more merging together as, as it's going along again Devin is in uh, simulating this part here and uh he gets a collision warning here what is 
you see down and when he does the simulation, we'll do it in a, in a second again. You can actually see, so you saw the tool turn red when it collided with the stock. And this is why it's so important that you actually take the time to set up your stock and, and get that set up because without it, um, you know, that's when bad things happen, right? And I think we all probably have tried it at one point that our tool holder uh, somehow gets uh, in too much contact with, with stock or work holding. Um, but also down in the timeline below, as he goes in to simulate the tour path, uh, now you will see that it will actually show red lines down there too. So not only do you have, can you look and see the tool holder is going to turn red when it collides, but you can also see down in the, in the timeline, little green bar below. So that gives you another indication of where you potentially have issues. And I would say too that the simulation of your tool path is probably one of the most critical things that you do absolutely need to take time to do. Um, even that it can, sometimes it can be like the most tedious thing ever. So looking down in Davin's timeline right now, we don't see any red lines, but it's a good indication of that we are, we are good. Another thing that Devin is doing when he's in simulating, what is a little trick that you maybe didn't know, if you're in simulation and you, you pause the simulation, if you hold down your left mouse button and dragging the mouse side to side, you can actually play the simulation back and forth. This is really good when you get to that time where you really want to zoom in close and see what happens. You hold down the left mouse, you can literally just kind of like move the mouse back and forth while holding the left mouse button and you will see the tool uh, moving out. I remember when I was at Ridlam that I would literally just program, I had these four, uh, four axis horizontal machines I would program and I would spend like an hour and 15 minutes with a cup of coffee in hand and just watching that, that simulation. And it was the most like boring thing ever, but you know, if you can save yourself from a tool press, that is worth a lot. Phil, how are you doing over on your side? So it seems that I lost a cooling fan in my laptop, as funny as it is, and it's overheating and thermal throttling. So not to say that I may be admitting defeat at the moment, but I may either have to admit defeat or I do have another laptop that I might have to jump to momentarily. Mm -hmm. However, looking at it, it does look as if Devin has completely ruined everything that I've done at this point. It looks like Devin is, uh, you know, is actually to the point now where he is already posting out, posting out code, what is, I think is pretty dang impressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty impressed too, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is the first time we've at Autodesk even tried to do something like this. Something was going to fail, and from what it seems, I'm very glad I have a warranty on my laptop, but I did lose a cooling fan altogether. So I may have to stop my stream momentarily and switch computers and see what I can come up with, but I don't think I'm going to catch him at this point. No, I don't think so. I, I think that's okay too. I, I would say... Really yeah, I, I would, would say if his simulation looks good and he's got everything down to the wire, done and machined, he may have to be declared the winner. However, we are only at 1031. So um, worst case scenario, we do still have, what, about 14 minutes for me to catch him on a computer switch? <laughs> so we're going to see what happens. I've seen I've seen crazier I, miracles. I just want to say that uh, that Devin have actually moved into now uh, putting in inspection. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, he is pretty much, uh, right now, the pot is running out on his house, out in his garage. That's and, all right. And he is certainly. So, Devin, one thing I would love if you would do uh, is because, you know, I think that I, 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 I'm pretty impressed about how much you got, you got up there so, so quick. I would love for you to just take a second um, when, when you catch your breath and take us a little bit through the different steps and thought process you had with, uh, with programming this part. So maybe we could just start kind of like uh, set up number one and uh, 
you could talk through while doing a slow simulation what tool path you decided to use and, and why yeah. you can kind of I think also when we get to this stock setup, we'd love to talk a little bit about STL files and things like that. So on this first operation here, um, just what I'm looking for really is, I know I have to make this part on one side. It's gonna be a little bit difficult to hold on the opposite side. So the first thing I'm looking for when I'm like examining a part like this is how could I hold it? Now, this certainly could have been a way for me to like start with it, but because of these sharp corners here, um, I'm kind of defaulting to having to machine it from this side or from the other side. So it looks to me like I can hit everything from those two sides because if I did hold it like this and clamp it from the side, I would have some fillets in these corners because even if we chuck up a square end mill, when we go to spin it, it's still gonna be round. Um, so it'd be pretty hard to make uh, you know sharp corners in here without like broaching it, which is obviously unnecessary. So um, I would wanna hold it from this side because this has kind of more meat on it for the second side when I flip it around and hold it in the vise. Um, so starting out um, on, on, on this side here, the first tool path I did do was a 3D um, adaptive and I have my 3D adaptive set up. So when I open up the 3D adaptive, um, it's actually pulling um, for like my step down, it's actually pulling from like my tool flute length. So if we look at my expression here, so whatever tool I go in there and select, it is going to, um, to, to grab that there. Um, so that helps me with programming because then I'm not taking a deeper cut than like my end mill is really allowed to do. Um, and then as far as like a resolution pass on this, uh, it's a step down. Technically it's a step up. It does do the maximum step down first and then step up from there and then go back to the maximum. So we want to look at this. The only thing I really adjusted on this one was the bottom. Um, I, I knew I probably wouldn't want to be um, all the way towards the bottom there. So this was, that's obviously a new operation, but in this one, I just limit it limit it to go to a certain level um, because I knew I was going to machine the most of machine the other side of it on the opposite end of the part. So um, just, to, just to kind of like echo what Devin just said there. So one of the things I want to highlight is this power of expressions. Now I would say personally, like I think exp using expression inside a cam is a little bit on the advanced side. And that's why of course Devin is, is here doing this today. Uh, but if you are new to CAM, you should know that this is a function that you have in the standard Fusion 360, where you can actually say that, you know, I want my tool depth to never exceed, for example, a certain flute length or something like that in, inside of that. So that's, that's one of these things that I, I think somebody like John Saunders have also done some videos on YouTube about expressions. He uses that a lot. Uh, so it's definitely something to test out. Certainly. And, and it, it should be known you can control pretty much any of the numerical values inside of Fusion. So if you have like, let's say, for example, a bull mill and you have a corner radius on there, you can have it default for your depth of cut to be below the model plus the amount of that radius. So you don't have a little fillet or a little scallop there that you got to try to clean off on the other side. So there's just a bunch of parameters in there you can you can kind of drive it from. Um, I did use a parallel to face this. So I do have a couple of operations in here um, that, I, that I do use all the time for templates. So the reason I chose parallel um, is because there are some obviously cutouts in here. In Fusion, we do know how easy it is to make like a regular facing tool path. Um, obviously here, if I just pick a, pick a flat end mill as my tool and hit okay, um, to generate this, you'll see that it just does some random passes around the part, which is fine. But in like a production setting, I do want to kind of keep this trimmed um, to like a minimal amount. So I'm not having my tool moving and not really cutting something that's not underneath it. So I use the, the parallel tool path here as like an automatic facing. Um, so I don't have to go in there and manually select like stock contours to trim it to those areas. Stock contours is a really powerful, um, thing here you can see in this one that I did created um, that I did create if we go into geometry and we select like this this top boundary here um, we can do that but we have to make a selection so we do get a similar thing it is kind of still dragging across the top of this so I don't even know if we're reducing a pass really um, 
but it, we would have to go in there and manually select it to trim it. So imagine we were making something like a pyramid. I don't ever start out with a facing toolpath, especially on a 3D part, because really to me, it's kind of, it's, it's wasting time because I don't need to face the top of the block just to look at it. It doesn't make, doesn't make much sense. So, um, I usually rough the part out and then any of those levels that are, that are high, I will then face them off to clean them because let's say you had a 10 by 10 block, but only one inch of it needed to be faced. It wouldn't make much sense to face that whole block. I love that. I love that. That's a, I love that. That's a, uh, that's a perfect cam inside. I would not have thought about using a parallel tool path for, uh, for roughing that. So that's love it. I'm going to, I'm going to take notes. That's great. Yeah. And then uh, some of the, just the bore tool pass here. Um, I do have templates like for these tools, depending on what it is, maybe it's like a through hole. So generally on a through hole, like if we, if we take a look at this, um, I have it automatically starting above the hole. Cause generally that's a little bit safer. Like if we go to a side view here and we turn this to wireframe, it'll, it's going to pop up off screen for me. But if we go to a wireframe here, normally I want to start above the part, not right on top of the part to start doing my kind of helix in. And then on a through hole, I would want to, you know, protrude through the part a little bit. So I have that automatically set up here. The other version of this that I have set up is an, a hole that's not a through hole. And, uh, my bottom height would just be to zero, but I would still have an additional top height in here. Um, and you can even set up your tool path to be like that by default. Uh, mine is the, basically the default right now. So we open up a brand new one here and we go to heights. You can see whatever our whole top and bottom is, we have zero offset there. So if I did go in here and select like this same bore and look at it from the side, we see it's exactly starting at the top and exactly going to the bottom, which might leave a little bit of pressure there or something, or might not even machine all the way if we flip it over and we have a little bit of variance there. So that's kind of why I do that. Um, the drilling, uh, Phil and myself uh, pretty much do this. Phil, Phil taught me this little trick here. Um, but same thing, instead of going to uh, geometry, um, what most people see is selected faces. Um, and then they, what they would do is select one of the faces and they could say select same diameter, which works fine, right, for manual selection. Um, but what we've done in the past is when we do use this diameter range, we can again use those expression values to automatically look for a sized hole that's related to our drill. So in this case, if I go over to my drill, we have a 332 drill. This is like a 094 around, around there. And if we go into my geometry, we see we're getting values that are kind of plus or minus that. And the expression that I, that I use used it um, when we look at this is just the tool diameter multiplied by 0.98 on the underside effectively giving me 90 98% of whatever the tools diameter is and then I just do the opposite on the maximum I go like 1.02 which effect effectively gives me 102 uh, percent of what the what the actual drill diameter is I mean like um, I think this is one of those things that again these expressions like if you are starting out in the beginning you're probably fine you you, you can tinker around with this, but, you know, as you're getting more and more proficient inside of Fusion programming parts, you definitely want at some point, you know, start thinking about these things because this is what is going to be, make you a faster programmer and uh, make somebody like Troy pay you more money, right? Right. And it, at the end of the day, like, it's an efficiency thing, right? I, I think Phil's in the same boat as me. We're, we're kind of lazy, right? We don't want to do, we don't want to do more work than we have to. So we really want to streamline our workflow and being able to go into a, an operation, just select my drill and have it automatically find those for me, whether I have one hole or a thousand, I think is a really big benefit. Would you um, talk a little bit about the, the stock you did with the STL? Yeah. So this is one thing I, so Today it does work better than this. And uh, if, if we if we actually, I think I have to un, um, protect these. Uh, so I'm gonna protect it and then I'm gonna unprotect it. But there's a few settings that recently came to Fusion in the update, which I probably should have been using. Um, I haven't tried it too much in between setups. So for me, it's just familiar to just save it and, and do it the way that I did it. Um, but up here under actions, there is a automatic in process stock generation. So if I, and then the other one is down here under stock visibility, this is popping up for me off my screen, but there's two options it says display uh, in process stock, which is also F8 to toggle it. And then the other thing you can turn it uh, to transparent. And this is really cool inside of Fusion. So if I right click on this and I hit generate on these, we'll see this is gonna take a little bit longer than it normally 
normally would. And actually what it's doing is for each operation, once a toolpath is generated, it's generating the STL mesh and saving it with the toolpath. So then when I go in here and instead of like before, if I want to simulate this contour toolpath, that's fine and all, but I would have to generate these in Fusion previously to see my resulting stock. Now inside of Fusion, if I just pick this contour toolpath, it actually shows me the after resulting stock for that toolpath. Additionally, if I right click on this and I hit simulate on this single operation, my stock here when I'm looking at it will start at the operation beforehand. So now I can play through this and simulate cleanly um, what, what, I what I have here for my, for my operation. So it's showing me the, pr the pre-stock before the operation. Um, and that's a setting you can turn on there in, vi in visibility um, to, to show this. So we don't have to go through and simulate every single operation. It is a little bit more taxing on your computer. So I do turn it off sometimes because I do get a little annoyed about the speed, but really it's another five or 10%. But if you're making tool pass all day, it does make a difference. So when you do need it, I turn it on. When I don't need it, I just shut it off. Um, and you can just toggle it here uh, by that little button. Um, it will still show here. So you'll have to also turn off the visibility either by hitting like F8 to turn it off or F8 will turn it back on. I was just hitting a little keyboard shortcut there. Um, and then the other one that I use here is a steep and shallow. Now this is a, a little bit cheating because I, I do use steep and shallow for two other things. I do like steep and shallow. Um, I get pretty clean results out of it. Um, I like the way that it has kind of slope containment built into it. And it's really three tool paths in one, right? And when I say three tool paths in one, it's it's either a parallel or a scallop with a contour tool path. So depending on how you wanna use it and how you wanna segment out that angle, um, but we can also leave it to be, uh, especially for multi-axis applications, either one or the other. So we in multi-axis contour, traditionally in like the HSM kernel here, we do have five axis like automatic tilting and it's under contour. If we go in here to passes and go to multi-axis tilting, but this is really automatic. So this really isn't giving you much power. Fusion is going to come up with a solution um, that, that'll work, right? It might not be the smoothest. It might not be the best. That's really why we have in um, steep and shallow here. Um, steep and shallow is the only tool path with the extension turned on um, that has this tool access page. This gives us really some additional controls that, uh, that, are, that are pretty good. Um, and when we go in here to tool axis, the primary mode is vertical, but if we have like the traditional lead and lean, this is off of the surface, but we have from point to point, from curve to curve. So these are some really cool options to, to do things that were just not possible before in Fusion. If I open up a, uh, a file here, I have a pretty good example of, of how, you can, uh, how you can use this to your advantage. So I have like this blower fan here, and this is a part that honestly, six, eight months ago would have been impossible to do inside of Fusion. Um, and now today, you know, with that steep and shallow, you can see in the design um, part of Fusion, I did put a little point here. So I just made kind of an offset plane, a sketch, and I used that point. And then what I did was I, in the steep and shallow, I have my tool axis to be from a point. So my tool axis is always going to point towards this point. And this is some some really high end control. I mean, the software I used to use cost a lot of money and this was the main thing we were kind of doing with it was drawing these segments, you, using this to kind of affect our tool axis, which is fine, but traditionally in HSM, if you understand, generally our surface or our pattern is going to dictate what direction our tool faces. This in steep and shallow really separates that, right? It separates our pattern out from the direction our tool is facing. So. When we, when we go in here and look at this, if we hit simulate on this, pretty, pretty cool again, we can see that, you know, there's some pretty hard like undercuts here. And if I'm going to try to play this uh, slow for you guys, but you can see, I mean, my tool is going all the way underneath that fan because it's constantly pointing at that point, which is really kind of for a part like this is what you need. You could draw a little line segment there, but you would get kind of motion side to side and it would slam into the end of that line and move. But really it's up to you. You can, and it's all parametric. So you can also go in there and change and modify what that shape or that contour is and get a different resulting tool path. So I think that's really good. And, and, and Leo, you asked a question earlier to talk a little bit about, you know, what the cam extension is. And I think, you know, that way this is simulating here is a good, is a good time to, to kind of talk a little bit about that. So the cam extensions is adding, you know, more high-end 
cam functions to Fusion 360. Uh, a lot of this stuff is coming from, uh, you know, our friends um, from across the sea in, in Birmingham, from, from the, the old Dell cam uh, crew, uh, from, from a lot of the great work that they have done with Power Mill, um, Feature Cam, and those other ones. So that's definitely. Uh, yeah, Power Shape, Power Inspect. So there's a multitude of software that's kind of being migrated into this, and it's really beneficial. I, I do want to make it clear there are a few things in here that you just couldn't do inside of Fusion, but a few of these things are really easy buttons, right? Like I can trim a toolpath, large, you know, you can pop into design, you can make a little boundary, you can use that for your boundary. But in, in, you know, inside of Fusion, we can even take a complex, you know, five axis toolpath like this and go to toolpath trim. And maybe I repaired this or welded this and I only needed to cut a side of it. Based on my view, I can just click on the screen and say, I want to keep the outside boundary here and hit okay. And this is really unique. Like this is stuff that's pretty new to Fusion. So it kept my entire toolpath the, the way that it was. It trimmed out what I asked it to. What's really cool also that people might not know is you see this little pencil here. It put that in my timeline. So when I pick this toolpath, I actually have a timeline down in the bottom of all the edits. So I'm, I'm, I know I'm a few seconds behind on the, on the screen here, but you'll see. Following along, it's good. So Leo, I think you definitely need to, uh, you know, reach out to us and we can give you more information on this because this is, if you have, you know, these type of machines, um, high end machines, you definitely want to look into, uh, to the extensions as a way. Could you, Devin, could you switch back uh, to the part you had before? Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to, I know we are getting close to end of time. We got to check in with Phil and see if he, if, if Phil just, you know, put his latest king down on the board or not. But I want to talk about uh, datums. So uh, one of the, Rob pointed out that where you put your datum on this part uh, was interesting and not in a, in a corner, you pick up T54. Yeah, so I put it in this bottom corner. Um, it would be pretty easy to pick up this side of the part, but I would probably pick up like my front jaw here. I mean, it really depends on the um, how we're machining it. The reason I did this is because on this stock here, this could be saw cut and this could be a multitude of random sizes. So for me your, to- What about your first setup? On your first setup? Um, in my first setup, I did use the top center. So my first setup, I used the top center because if I have a saw cut that's a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, when I'm doing my probing, I'm generally going to be splitting whatever that distance is. So if I have an extra half of an inch, it's not going to go to one side. Um, that's generally why I like to use that. Um, the only other one I would use would be for picking a specific location. Again, if I was like repairing something or had a feature that was existing. Um, so I just pick it up here and that's usually why I usually always do it that way because the stock does vary. Um, and on the second side here, um, when I was picking my origin, I did want to make sure it was down in this corner here because it'd be easy to rest the part up against this face, it'd be easy to pick up this face. And we could just pick up the bottom jaw of the vice here um, for, for our Z axis. And that gives us all three of our datums. We have a clear reference point to put our part in there and we're pretty much good to go on that second side. A lot of the times using the, this hanger method where we have all this material up here, you could see it'd be pretty difficult to come down and probe something here that that, uh, that was finished. So that that's kind of why I did that. I think I, I, I totally, I, I agree with that, right? So Rob, just, you could pick up on the first setup, you could pick up a, a, a corner, wouldn't be anything necessarily wrong with that. But if your stock, you know, is saw cut and you're picking up the, let's say the upper left corner, and then you have a part that is a little bit longer than the one you picked up, then you could run the risk that when the end mill comes down to the end, it's going to take take more material. So picking up the outsides and place yourself in the center of the part is probably the, you know, if you have a probe in your machine or something, uh, the easiest thing. And then to, to Devin's point in the, in the bottom for the second setup, um, you know, if you pick up, I have always done what, what Devin does here, like pick up the bottom at the solid jaw because you know that that solid jaw never moves. But I will say, I one time, came across a, a customer who always always picked up uh, the, the front left lower corner. Um, and when I asked him why that was, was because he said, well, if I always pick up the front left corner, then when I look at my G code, I know that if I ever see a minus, 
then something went wrong. So that's another little tip on how you can pick things up and maybe use that to your uh, to your advantage. Thank you so much, Devin. Phil, where, um, where are you at? Yeah, give me one minute. So I did have to switch to a completely different computer and all kinds of craziness on my side, but let me pull my new live stream in. So I'm going to have to stop sharing the main screen here real quick for everybody. Um, give me one sec here. And with that, it's going to take me a moment to get everything set on my side. While you're doing that, I can see we can still see uh, Davin's. So, Dav Davin, you also created a setup sheet. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop sharing That's for everybody okay. at home here. But we can talk a little bit about the setup sheets. That's another thing um, that, you know, I, I have to admit that sometimes I've been too lazy to create one of those. But they can really save you a lot from not running back and forth to the computer, right? Like... Yeah, and on the machine like, oh, what tool was it again? And then you're running back into this to the CNC room to uh, to look at your computer. All right, Lars, go ahead and re-request remote control, and please nobody dock me for points for all the red on my screen at the moment. Um, that way, you could have control while I continue on with what I'm doing, and we should be ready to rock and roll here. All right, perfect. I think we're gonna jump over to you, Phil. We are getting close to time, but I do want to give you a chance. To uh, talk a little bit about what what did what you were able to create in uh, with computers catching fires and you know yeah this. so it, uh, yeah my other computer is completely shot like black screen and everything I can look at it I don't know how my webcam is still broadcasting but I figured I would just not touch it so that being said is what I actually started with is I had to go from pretty much scratch. and in the moment of time I think I have been going for about eight or nine minutes. Um, I did get the front and back mostly done. I think there's a little tweaking on the other side here, but as all of you could see is I did a little different approach. I did face, I did 3d adaptive to a set point. And then I did do things like rest machining with a quarter inch end mill where I could knock out bores and those type tolerances in the inside. I know one major difference between Devin and me is I used a radius mill for the fillets with the exception of this back little corner here where I just went for a 3D contour. I did was moving fast to catch up, so I should have did this both ways to speed up my cycle time. One other thing I did add in was the chamfer tool to do all of my square edges. So I did put an edge break on everything as well using a chamfer tool. And as you can see here on the flip of the part, going back the other way, I just duplicated setup one, same as kind of Devin did. I did a couple different changes and all of that, roughed out my part from the backside as much as I could, I use 2D adaptive clearing with that quarter inch end mill in my slot and my landing. And then again, repeated the process with the radius mill anywhere I could. And again, there's some tool crashing there just because I didn't get a lot of time behind this. But I did want to go in and do things like break all my edges and all of that fun stuff. So, so I, I'll say I, I, that's pretty important. I'm impressed about Devin. You did a hell of a job. In I, time, yeah, I, will, I will admit that you did due a to feet, I am admitting that <laughs> due to technical <laughs> difficulties and hardware failure. But now, uh, one thing I want to say, though, that I think you're making a good point here. So anybody who's watching, if people are still watching this, um, the edge break is one of those interesting things. And I think it depends on again, what kind of shop you're working in and, 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 and how you're working on stuff, but taking, taking the extra time to go in with a, with a tool and break the edges. And I would even, personally, I would even do this uh, when I got a file. So I used to work like Troy, uh, our customer early on, where I maybe got the part from the customer. I would still go in on any outside shop corners I would actually add a little chamfer on those outside corners, just like just the tiniest little like uh, chamfer, even not visible to the eye. But what that would do is that, you know, you, you break a lot of the sharp edges. Um, taking a few minutes of a little time to do that to your parts is, is huge at the end. And I mean, one thing is that if you're the one who's going to defer the parts afterwards, you're going to, you're going to be petting yourself on the shoulder and say, that was good. I spent the time on that. But also if you have people who's going to handle the parts afterwards, you know, maybe you don't do the deburring. Maybe you have somebody else 
I don't know, the shift if you're doing production run or something like that, that I like, I know, um, you know, you guys have done. Um, they're going to love you for taking the time to do that. So that's definitely one of these small tips that I, I would recommend people to think about. So another one that I did, I know uh, you guys were going over expressions a lot. And one that I personally like very well is the ability to use a spot drill to find all my holes automatically. Devin, did you do a spot drill template by chance? I did. Okay. Not. not. Oh, you did not. All right. So same kind of concept. This is one of my favorite templates here. I use the ability of an expression. However, the major difference in my expression here when you do diameter range is I actually say tool tip diameter because on most of my spot drills, they always came in with a flat on the tip. So I have to account for that tap or that flat area somehow. The same thing goes is I do it just a little different than Devin does. My upper threshold, I go tool diameter by 95%. Again, this is a 3-8 spot. I wouldn't want to try to spot drill a 3-8 hole. So I need to be just a hair under that. That's a good, uh, that's a good tip. Yeah. They always like the tip on a, on a, on a spot drill is always like, I don't know, 3,000 or something like that. It screws you up at least, right? Whenever yeah, you... yeah, there's this fancy page that you could find that tells you the standard, but I think it's like 30 thou on a 3 eighths or something. <laughs> So it definitely comes in handy because I've been to several shops um, in the case of Troy's shop, not saying anything bad is their system was, is you would spot drill your hole in chamfer. Then you would drop the tool at the controller. But then when we started having a battle between two softwares, I would set my tools up exactly in the machine versus using the controller to compensate what was going on. So there was a little confusion there at first, but it all got smoothed out after the fact I just programmed like they did until Finally, they switched to Fusion 360, then realized, wait, we have all these cool features. Why not use them to our advantage? That's absolutely awesome. All right. So this was I, I, this was a lot of fun for me, at least. <laughs> so I know that, that we have some people here on the Zoom webinar. So thank you so much, you guys who, jo who joined there. And I was supposed to be also streaming live to, to the YouTube right now. But of course, it's awesome for anybody who took the time to watch this. Uh, definitely want to ask you guys out on YouTube to please leave some comments what you thought of this because first of all, Devin, Phil, I'm so impressed by your guys' skills. Like you guys are freaking rock stars. I would have, I would have even, I wouldn't have gotten 25% of to, to where you guys did. So it was an absolute pleasure uh, to just see you guys working and, and for you guys to share your knowledge uh, on for this. So thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and also add in there that if anybody has more questions or anything about this, feel free to reach out to our sales team. Um, they can get you in and see the product in a demonstration. I know a lot of new customers are always curious about Fusion, its capabilities. Myself and Devin, both two machinists, we did just kind of go through this. I know there was some things like speeds and feeds and machine type stuff that we didn't express. Um, ideally, this was just to show you guys three axis machining and how fast you can get to G coding to put that program in the machine. Yeah, at, you guys did this, job. Yeah, at this point, we're also going to open it up to question and answer. Um, Devin is controlling the YouTube channel. So if any questions come in there, as well as Lars and myself can see any questions coming through on the Zoom, uh, feel free to ask those at this time and we'll be glad to show you or set anything up. As well, if you guys want to see anything more like this in the future, I know this was a first run and with technical difficulties as expected, um, it did actually go pretty good. So maybe we could throw some design ones together or maybe something with generative design for a customer base. Devin, do you got any questions? Um, I don't. I actually have to run to another meeting right now guys so well, have a good one take it take it easy and uh yeah ah, like we are on the top of the hour so if you do yeah. have questions feel free to leave comments i didn't realize i was so caught up with programming but um everybody have a great rest of your day lars thanks for hosting this thank you so much for having me and uh, we will definitely jump in and, and answer questions in the comments area for sure all right i'm gonna stay on for a little bit i do have some spare time so that we can also go ahead and answer those questions in the zoom section. 
I actually think that we gotten those questions pretty much taken care of as we went through that. Phil, um, I think people were pretty impressed. Uh, one question <laughs> is, can we get more CAM tutorials on YouTube? That is definitely something that, uh, that, that we want to do, uh, do more of for sure. Now that Lars sees what me and Devin do, odds are he's going to push it to us, right, Lars? Yes, yes, please, please. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate you joining us for this. This was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one, everybody.